the backwards. Okay, now here, this is the link right here. Everything's <laughs> backwards! You can get the link right No, right there. Yeah, I know that. Okay, if I go. Okay, we got it. What's this?
to all of you and we're hoping that you're able to hook up with this uh, Leon and Paul and Caleb are working very hard to try to get this to work so we're hoping that it works 
Uh, it's really a joy to be together in this way. Uh, I know that all of you can see me, but I cannot see you. But I am going to this morning pretend that I am looking into your faces like a normal Sunday morning. And so I hope that the Lord can be magnified by our being together here in this way today. Technology has its challenges, but it's a wonderful thing at a time like this when we cannot meet a regular basis. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the blessings of this Lord's day. Even though we cannot gather as a congregation, we hope that we're able to connect in this way. And by doing this this morning, I pray that each of our hearts would be encouraged to press on and to be faithful. And Father, as we look into your word this morning, open up this word to us so that we may understand, that we may comprehend what we are reading and talking about. Bless us then, and may your Holy Spirit move us to faithfulness as we share together this morning in this way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans chapter 8 while I give just a short introduction to the message this morning. We'll be looking at the last part of Romans chapter 8. Now we as a church and as a community and as a nation, we are experiencing something we have not known before. It's the thing of separation. And there's something about separation that does not feel good. There are times when separation can cause us to be quite lonely, actually. And for some of you, you may be dealing with fears, with uncertainties, with uneasiness, or even questions about why all of these things are taking place. And while all of that is a reality to us this morning, and all of those things are happening to us, I would like to share with you this truth. When we have a relationship with Jesus Christ, God himself has assured us that he will never separate himself from us. That's a fact. That's a truth that God will not separate himself from his people. God has promised to never leave his children nor forsake them. And I want that truth to settle down in our hearts as we read the scriptures this morning. And now I'll be reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 35 to the end of the chapter. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril, or sword, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. This scripture this morning ought to be just like music to our ears. There is nothing that can separate us from the love of Christ. God's love is not an emotional kind of love that depends upon the response of the other person. Most of us know that kind of love quite well. For example, when you become interested in someone as a young man or as a young lady, you look for a response in the other person. And when you demonstrate love to them and the response is accepted and encouraged, love grows. But in the event you make that advance and love is not reciprocated or responded to, then it dies and we move on to something else. But God is not like that. God's love does not depend upon the response of the other person. 
because God's love is an act of his will. But God commended his love. Commended means proved his love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you understand that God's love toward us did not depend upon our response? He died for us while we were yet sinners. That means even when we were ungodly, even when we were sinners, he loved us. It did not depend upon our response. God is the only kind of God, the only person that has this kind of love. This love originates with God and is found in him and in him alone. And only the believer of all people on the planet, only the believer is able to know this kind of love because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that is given to us. We'll be looking at that verse a little bit later in Romans 5. The unbeliever does not have the Holy Spirit dwelling within him, and because of that, he cannot know this kind of love that God has until he comes to Christ. And when we come to Christ, the Holy Spirit sheds this love, which does not require response. It sheds this love and gives it to us in our own hearts. Now, if God provided salvation for us while we were his enemies, what will he do for us and provide for us now that we are his children? And this is what we want to look at now this morning. The question going back again to verse 35 is, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? I've gone to great lengths to talk about this great love of God. Now, who's going to separate us? That's our word, separate us from this love and from Christ. And then the Holy Spirit lists seven different things, seven methods, I would call them, that Satan uses against us to try to separate us from God. It is important that you and I realize that we are in a battle. This, these things that happen to us, these seven things, are things that originate with Satan that he uses to try to get us to separate ourselves from God. And he is the enemy of our soul, and we need to remember that. And he is the one that brings these events into our lives. And the wonderful thing is that God uses these very things that he brings to our lives, these events, these methods, God uses them for his glory. And this is the wonderful thing about God. So let's look at each of these seven things. I will give you a very short uh, definition for each one. The first one that is mentioned is tribulation. This is a very broad term for trials of any kind of nature, tribulation. Then it mentions distress. These are times when we are subjected to oppression or to pressure when we are in distress, oppression or pressure. Then there's persecution. This is the adverse opinions of unbelievers. Unbelievers can persecute the believer with an opinion that is very different than ours. And unfortunately, sometimes even believers, professed believers, can also uh, have adverse opinions which bring persecution to the child of God. Famine. This is the lack of food or finances because of severe economic pressure. Famine. Nakedness. When we are unable to purchase uh, sufficient clothing, then we suffer nakedness. Peril. A general term again, any kind of danger. Accidents. Uh, sickness, any kind of danger, peril. And finally, the seventh one mentioned, the method that Satan uses is the sword. This is not only referring to war, but also simply the fear of the loss of life. Now, Satan uses all of these techniques. And interestingly enough, we've experienced some of these in the last couple of months. I would be willing to say that most of us during these last two weeks, a few weeks, 
have thought about the possibilities of each of these seven things. Each of these seven things. Satan may be at times, and he is often successful at frightening us and making us afraid in these situations. And sometimes even, ca even causing us to fear when these things become realities to us. But God's love remains stable, even though we ourselves may falter and flounder at times with fear and uncertainty. His love is unchanging, it is steadfast, it is sure. And that is what we comfort ourselves with this morning. <coughs> I'd like to move from this verse after to ask this question, who shall separate us from God's love? It lists these seven things. And then we have a verse that I've often wondered why this is put in this place, but I'm beginning to understand why it is as I'm going through these last couple of months. The next verse says, as it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Have you ever thought that that verse seems sort of out of place in this section? It's not really, of course, I knew it wasn't, but I never felt like I fully understand what the Holy Spirit was wanting to say to me with this verse. I'm beginning to understand that what he's saying is that there are times when we take our vision, our eyes off of God, then we feel like sheep without a shepherd. Sheep need a shepherd. You've heard me say that many, many times. And without a shepherd, a sheep has no guide. He has no protector. He has no one to provide for him. And that's how we sometimes feel when these seven things start to come and present themselves in our lives. We feel like we're being killed all the day long. We feel like we're sheep accounted for the slaughter. And sheep have no defense mechanisms. Sheep don't fight back when they are tackled or taken to the slaughter. Sheep do not paw. They do not spit. They do nothing. And that's the way we often feel when these things come to us as a flood. We feel so defenseless. We feel helpless. And that is when we take our eyes off of God. And so the Holy Spirit knows how these things can affect us. And he puts in here a verse to help us understand that this is a reality for us. We need to get our vision back in the right place and our focus back on God. Now let's go back to our text. Let's look at what we've talked about so far. The question is, who shall separate us from the love of God? And then imagine list these seven methods. Now he answers, the Holy Spirit answers the question, can we be separated from the love of God? And the first word in verse 37 is nay. Boys and girls, you know what that means. It means no, no. In all these things, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. In all these things refers to the extent of the conquest. In all things. It's trying to teach us there is no limit to the things that can be conquered through him that loved us through Christ. There's no limit to those things. Only seven are mentioned here. This verse says there's no limit. It refers to the extent of the conquest that can be ours. When it comes to the degree now of our victory, we have another phrase in that verse. In all these things, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. That's the degree of our victory. We're more than a conqueror. To conquer means to gain the victory. To gain the victory. You remember Alexander the Great conquered all of the then known world in his lifetime as a young man. He gained the victory. He was a conqueror, but he was not more than a conqueror. He was a conqueror, I agree, a great conqueror, but he was not more than a conqueror. The reason being, he conquered all of the then known world and then wept 
because there were no more worlds to conquer. And he died at a very young age. What did all of this gain him? What had he gained? He knew not Christ. He knew not God. In the life, he was a conqueror, but he was not more than a conqueror. To be more than a conqueror is to gain the advantage over what has been conquered. Now let's apply that to our lives. That happens when we begin to understand that the adversities that Satan brings to us, when we are able to work through them by keeping our eyes on Christ, God takes those very adversities that we face and turns them around to help us and to use those very things for his glory. And in that sense, then we become more than a conqueror. This is explained to us earlier in the book of Romans in chapter five. And I'm going to read just three verses here to help us understand how we are more than a conqueror. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. There's the word that was back in chapter eight, the very first word, tribulations. We glory in that, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. That is the way it works. When we go through these kind of things, as we face them patiently, we gain experience. And experience teaches us there is hope. And hope maketh not ashamed because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. What a great privilege we have to know our Lord Jesus Christ who takes these things that come to us and turns them around for the glory of God and works in our lives to teach us the lessons that he has for us to learn. This conquest then is completely fulfilled when we get to the 38th verse of our main text when the writer says, for I am persuaded. This refers to the child of God who has been through these kind of experiences. And now he comes to this conclusion. I am persuaded. And then he goes on to mention 10 things, all great in themselves, which cannot separate us from God's love. For I'm persuaded that neither death, that's the first one. Death to the unbeliever is the end. It's a finality. He fights it. He avoids it. He does anything to get away from it. But this isn't true for the child of God. Death, which is an enemy, it's a great thing. But death is what God uses, even though it's not a a pleasant thing to go with and experience or uh, have happen to us and our loved ones. Death, then, God uses to transport his children from this life into his presence. This is a wonderful illustration how how God takes things that Satan wants to use against us and turns them into his glory, to glorious things for us. So we're persuaded that neither death nor life, anything that can happen to us in this life, nor angels, and I think that refers to primarily fallen angels who work against us and fight against us, nor principalities, nor powers, whatever Satan uses against us in that area, nor things present, anything present in our life, nor things to come, that's things that we may face, none of those things, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I would like to now conclude the message this morning by giving you a benediction that is found later in this book of Romans in chapter 11, starting at verse 33. In light of what we have talked about and what we meditated upon this morning, here's the benediction. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. 
Isn't that our conclusion this morning? As we think about how nothing can separate us from God's love, oh, we admire the unsearchable judgments and the wisdom of, a God, of God and his ways. They are past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory forever and ever. God is at work in our lives. He is wanting to teach us many things through these experiences we are going through. Are we listening? As we look forward to getting together to, again, and if the Lord tarries, there will come a day we can meet together again as a church in our church house. The first Sunday we get together, we want to have an Easter service. That's our plan. The second Sunday we get together, Lord willing, we want to have a service where we share and talk about what we have learned through this experience. And I tell you that this morning so you can be thinking about what are you learning? Don't forget what you're learning and share it with us when we get back together. To all of you this morning, we are in good hands. We are in very good hands. Troubles can and do come to us, but God uses each of them for his glory. Through Christ, we are more than conquerors and nothing, absolutely nothing, can separate us from him. Let's close with prayer. Father, thank you so much for this time that we've had to be together this morning. Thank you for the leading of your Holy Spirit and the way in which your Holy Spirit fills our hearts with your love, which is an incomprehensible kind of love, which does not depend upon the response of the person being loved. We thank thee for that love. We thank thee for the lessons that you are teaching us today and through these experiences. We do not want to resist them. We want to learn from them. And we want to keep our eyes focused on Jesus. Be with all of our brotherhood, especially this Lord's day. May they find grace in your sight. Protect them, keep them in your loving care, and make a way for them in the days to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may have noticed on the blackboard here, there's a couple of things I want you to remember. The offering today is for the building fund and for Trisha. Also, each week as we do this, we're going to have certain people we want you to pray for in the coming week. This week, we want you to pray for Richard, Lola, Carol, Colleen, and John Gerber. And finally, a thank you to Paul, Neon, and Caleb. The Lord's blessings to you.
Thank <laughs> you.